Hello, my name is Dr. Reka Mancat, and I'm a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about Minoka. So what is Minoka? Kind of a fancy word, but basically Minoka stands for myocardial infarction with no obstructive coronary atherosclerosis. So I think that's why we call it Minoka, much easier to say. But if we think about heart disease, we think about traditional atherosclerosis leading to a myocardial infarction. So if you look at a coronary artery, we see that there's a progression of plaque in that coronary artery. And then for some reason that plaque ruptures, which can occlude that artery leading to a myocardial infarction, either an ST elevation myocardial infarction or a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, depending on the decrease in the blood flow to that area of the myocardium. Obviously, our goal is to have risk factor optimization, so we never have this progression of plaque or plaque rupture. But clearly, lots of people still present with a heart attack with the sort of classic reason for that presentation. And that's really shown here very nicely that you know traditional heart disease is atherosclerotic, meaning plaque from cholesterol and other risk factors. That can be stable plaque that just presents with chest pain at certain uh, exertional levels that might be evaluated in the outpatient setting, or it might be a plaque that's rupturing and occluding that artery. And that's really this acute coronary syndrome presentation with the classic heart attack. But there's other reasons that you could get decreased blood flow to the coronary circulation. And that can be due to vasospastic disease where the artery spasms, or disease of the microcirculation, so microvascular disease with the small vessels that are not well seen on coronary angiography. But all these uh, mechanisms can actually overlap. So let's just look at a, a case. This is a 58-year-old woman who comes to the emergency room with two hours of chest pain after she had an argument with her son. She comes pain-free. She does have high blood pressure on treatment. She smoked in the past. She's got pre-diabetes as well as obesity. She's hypertensive on exam, her BMI is elevated, otherwise the exam's unremarkable. Her EKG, however, does show STT changes in the anterior lateral leads, but no ST elevation. Her troponin is elevated and it does go up at the two hour recheck, but otherwise the rest of her laboratory data is unremarkable. She goes to coronary angiography and here's the left system, here's the right system, and we don't see anything. You don't see any uh, obstructive lesion here, the arteries got, have good flow, everything looks fine. So the question is, what caused this heart attack? Now, some might say, well, it's not a heart attack because the arteries looked fine. But you have to remember that the definition of a myocardial infarction or a heart attack has nothing to do with what we see on the coronary uh, anatomy when we do angiography. The definition is really the rise and fall of the blood test, the troponin, with at least one of the values being quite high above the 99th percentile of the upper reference limit. And evidence of ischemia on either EKG, so the cardiogram shows ischemia, or the symptoms are very suggestive of uh, ischemic heart disease, or there's some imaging evidence of loss of myocardium or new wall motion abnormality, so that could be on nuclear testing or echocardiography. So that's the definition of myocardial infarction. We have to remember that not everybody who comes in with a myocardial infarction, that means symptoms with EKG changes or blood tests, have this obstructive disease. And interestingly, women have more of this non-obstructive disease. So this was a study, now quite old, but showed that if you go on to have an angiography, and if you're a female versus a male, whether you have STT changes or positive troponins, you have a higher likelihood of having insignificant coronary disease or non-obstructive disease. So this entity is a bit more common in females. This is a nice algorithm that shows how we should approach somebody with Minoka. So again, they have a myocardial infarction by their symptoms and signs, meaning troponin or EKG in their story, but they have no obstructive lesion identified on angiography, which is defined as no lesion greater than 49%. Well, right then during the angiography, you have to think of, well, what's the reason for this presentation of an acute coronary syndrome? Some of that might be defined on the angiography itself with other imaging that you could do at the time, an LV gram, ultrasound of the, uh, the coronary artery at the time. Laboratory data may tell you something. Maybe the patient is severely anemic or they have an infection and it's a type two myocardial infarction. So we have to recognize there's lots of other things that may have a very similar presentation.
sometimes despite all of that, we don't know. And we have to consider additional imaging such as a cardiac MRI or a transesophageal echo to really try to figure out what caused this event because there is treatment implications. So this, again, summarizes some of the other etiologies for this minoca. Again, the artery could be spasming. You could have had thrombosis right at that lesion site, but it was at a non-obstructed lesion, meaning the lesion was maybe 10% beforehand, but a blood clot developed right there, and it's still not fully obstructive. You could have a Takotsubo cardiomyopathy or stress cardiomyopathy, microvascular dysfunction, or an embolic phenomena. So we'll talk about some of these etiologies in a little bit more detail. First of all, spasm of the artery. This is not a patient who presented with a heart attack, but she was pretty close to one. And she had symptoms that all the world sounded like traditional atherosclerotic heart disease. We took her to angiography and the arteries look fine, but we gave acetylcholine and we see here that her left anterior descending artery spasm from the mid portion all the way down. When we gave nitroglycerin, it relieved that spasm. And she had her same exact symptoms during this. So we made the diagnosis that this, her symptom profile was due to spasm. So again, the treatment is different. Um, and it also tells us, uh, you know, what's been causing her symptomatology when we can give this provocative testing. Endothelial function testing, you can also look for microvascular disease during this testing with provocative maneuvers, which look at coronary flow reserve. So it's a, a great tool to have to help diagnose what the etiology of this acute presentation might be. What about stress cardiomyopathy? Lots of different names for it. Apical ballooning, stress cardiomyopathy, Takotsubo, based on the, the pot, the, the shape of the pot that Japanese used to uh, capture uh, octopus. Uh, looks like the way the heart looks uh, in this condition. Or broken heart syndrome. This is more common in women, usually postmenopausal women. Classically, it was described after some type of emotional or physiologic stress, although we see lots of patients who don't have this uh, precursor. They all the world can look like an, uh, a heart attack with ST elevation. So for all the world look like a classic traditional uh, heart attack. They have chest pain, they have positive uh, uh, blood tests for troponin. And frequently they go right to angiography because again, they present like a heart attack. But again, this is the patient that when you do that angiogram, you don't see any obstructive disease. Typically, we make this diagnosis when an echocardiogram is done after the angiogram, and we see the typical wall motion abnormalities showing a marked area of wall motion abnormality um, that goes along with the positive troponins and the symptom profile. Overall, the prognosis is good, although patients could have recurrent uh, symptoms. But why is it important to identify this? Well, again, the treatment is supportive. They may not need the traditional uh, treatments such as statin medications, because again, it's not due to atherosclerosis. What about this condition, spontaneous coronary artery dissection? This obviously has uh, taken on a, a lot of importance as we recognize this more and more. But this is a circumflex artery showing uh, a lesion here. The rest of the arteries look completely fine with no obstruction, but this unusual look right here. And this is an artery that has sp spontaneous coronary artery dissection. A lot of times, though, it might be hard to diagnose just with that angiography, and sometimes intravascular ultrasound can be beneficial, not only for this condition, but also for other causes of minoca to really look inside the artery to see what might be the etiology. Here in uh, spontaneous coronary dissection, we see actually hematoma in the wall of the artery, and sometimes we can actually see a dissection entry point. And so again, helps make the diagnosis because the treatment is very different. The reason the treatment is different is because SCAD is not due to atherosclerosis. It affects mostly young women, the average age being in the early 40s, mostly women with really no traditional risk factors for coronary atherosclerosis, meaning they don't have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, or diabetes very often. It's not that rare now that we're uh, identifying and able to recognize this more on angiography. We realize it's not rare. There's some familial cases. Typically, though, this presents when they come in with an acute coronary syndrome, usually an ST elevation MI. So you don't get a lot of warning that this is happening because they present acutely. The management, again, is different. It's important to recognize it, but it can be challenging to diagnose it. You have, a, have to have a high index of suspicion. So think of it in a young uh, female with no traditional risk factors who typically can be quite active. If the angiography is not clear-cut, you can use intravascular ultrasound or OCT. 
they usually have a, some amount of coronary tortuosity. But the big issue here is if there is good blood flow in that coronary artery, sometimes the best thing is to be conservative and not try to intervene on that artery because there is excessive complications with PCI. Sometimes it's not you can't avoid it, but if you can, you try to be conservative. Often that dissection heals without any intervention more than 60% of the time. But unfortunately, there is a recurrence rate that you have to recognize. The survival is actually better than the survival related to atherosclerosis. But again, this is affecting young women with no risk factors, so it can clearly be very anxiety provoking. There's lots of things to consider as far as uh, etiologies for coronary artery dissection, the big one being fibromuscular dysplasia, but there's other things that we're not fully, uh, we don't know about, emotional or exertional. There may be some collagen or genetic defect, and obviously this does occur in pregnancy, so something possibly hormonally uh, related here as well. We do image other vasculature in a patient who presents with uh, SCAD. We look at their head and neck vessels as well as abdomen pelvis, looking for fibromuscular dysplasia, which is seen here, this beaded appearance in the iliac vasculature and femoral vasculature. This could be seen in the renal arteries as well. Why this is important, again, is to recognize the link, but also important for surveillance of this peripheral vasculature for long term. The long-term management of SCAD, uh, rehab is very, very important. We do use aspirin. Obviously, if they've gotten stented, we use dual antiplatelet therapy. We treat other conditions as appropriate if they have heart failure, if, again, if they've been stented. We only use statin medications if they meet guidelines for primary prevention, not for the SCAD event. We consider nitrates or calcium channel blockers for spasm and chest pain. We do the vascular screening. We frequently send patients to medical genetics. And we do have to talk about pregnancy and contraceptives in this patient population. So the take home points for Minoka, remember the definition of a heart attack under acute coronary syndrome is symptoms that are highly suggestive of uh, ischemic heart disease with evidence of an abnormal uh, electrocardiogram or positive cardiac enzymes. However, it's very important to recognize that non-obstructive uh, etiologies can present just like the obstructive ones. So you have to recognize that there might be a, another etiology for somebody who presents with a heart attack. And why is it important to investigate these other potential causes? Because they may require completely different treatment and have different long-term implications. Thanks a lot for your time and attention.